My life has been blessed today, this weekend, to be with you. Thank you very much. I hope you've had a good day. I want to ask you, are you 100% sure, absolutely positive, that you are in the family of God? I mean, I'm not talking about guessing or hoping. I'm talking about knowing for a fact that you are in the family of God. I want to begin with you by noticing that there are some who think they are in the family of God who according to Scripture, not according to me, but according to Scripture, are in for a shock. I want to go to Matthew chapter 7 as we begin this evening, and I want to notice with you that there are some that Jesus depicts as saying to him on that day of judgment that they know him. In fact, look at verse 21 of Matthew 7. This is Jesus closing out the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Stop right there, please. That shows you, it shows me, that according to the Word of God, according to Jesus, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, to him is going to necessarily enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, does he ever tell us who will be sure that they'll enter the kingdom of heaven? Fortunately, he does. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but, here we go, he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. If you've done the will of the Father in heaven, you can know you're going to heaven. You don't have to wonder about it, speculate about it. You can know it beyond any shadow of a doubt. You can know eternal life is yours, 1 John 5, 13. And you know, some people think they have that. They think they know that. But I want you to watch verse 22 of Matthew 7. It's a rather sobering text. Many will say to me in that day, look at what they're calling him. Lord, Lord, these aren't atheists. These are not Jews who don't believe Jesus is the Christ. These are not religious people who have not believed that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. They call him Lord. They actually believe that he is. And they say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And Jesus says he will look at that very same people, that group of people that called him Lord and did wonderful things on his behalf, and he will look at that very same group and say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, how shocking would it be on the day of judgment for you and for me to think, oh, this is so exciting. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I'm sure he'll recognize me. And then to get before him and to have him say, I never knew you. Friends, that makes me want to double check, triple check, quadruple check, and make sure that I'm really truly in the family of God. Did he give me any litmus test by which to know that I'm in the family of God? I already showed you Matthew 7, 21b. He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. But you know, that's where some people say, but preacher, we can't understand the will of God. It's too confusing. No, it is not. He's not the author of confusion. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, when you read, you may understand. And it says in Ephesians 5, 17, understanding what the will of the Lord is. Yes, you and I can understand and know that we understand what the will of the Lord is. But I tell you, the text that really is going to be our camping out place tonight is Matthew chapter 12. I want you to notice what happened in Matthew 12. Some years ago, I was assigned to speak on a question that I will frankly admit to you, that I was a new preacher at the time, I will frankly admit to you, I didn't even know it was in the Bible, much less that Jesus had asked it. But I preached on that subject then, and I've preached it so many times since then because of the fact that this is a vital question. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Verse 46, Matthew 12. It's been a very busy day in the life of our Lord. He's teaching multitudes. He's been dealing with so many issues, and he's still talking, still teaching. 
And while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his, his brethren, they would really be his half-brothers because uh, Jesus did not have a biological father. He had the Holy Spirit to miraculously bring about his conception within Mary. And so they're his half-brothers and his mother. They stand outside and notice they desire to speak with him. They want to talk to Jesus. And someone says, behold, verse 47, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? That seems like a rather unusual question for Jesus to be asking. Who is my mother and who are my brethren? Did he not know who his own mother and brothers were? If you can believe it, I actually read one commentator who suggested that because it had been such a busy day in the life of our Lord, he suffered a temporary memory lapse and really didn't know who his mother and brothers were. Come on, come on. We know better than that. We should. Jesus, do you not know who you're... Oh, yeah, I know exactly who my mother and brothers are, but I want you to think spiritual family. Who is my mother and who are my brethren? Watch then he, verse 49, stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. And then he gave this explanation. For whosoever, see if this sounds familiar, shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Yeah, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus comes back to that in Matthew 12, verse 50. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. If you want to know whether you're one of his spiritual relatives, then ask yourself this question. Have you really done the will of the Father in heaven? Now, when I say do the will of the Father in heaven, I mean, are you willing to submit to all of it? True or false, the people back in Matthew 7 had done some wonderful things and did believe that Jesus was the Lord, they got that much right. Yes. Question, is it enough to do part of what he says or do we need to do all that he asks? A farmer left his boys a will in which he said, Now boys, when I die, I want you to build a fence at this spot on the property. And his boys looked that over and looked at each other and said, Father's a genius. Can you think of a better place to put a fence on this property than when Father's will says to put it? No, I can't. Now, we're going to put the fence right where Father's will says to put it. That's a brilliant choice. Yes, that's where that fence should go. And then the second thing of their Father's will. I want you to build a barn at this spot on the property. And they said, you know what? We need another barn and can you think of a better location for that barn than where Father's will says to put it? No, I can't. That's the spot. That's got to be the spot. There's no better place for it than that. So they built the barn right where their Father's will said to build the barn. Third item, I want you to dig a well at this spot on the property. Brother, Father was a genius, you admit. Yeah, he was brilliant. But do you think he missed this one? I really do. I, I don't think the well should go there. I think it should go over here. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's the better place for the well. Their father's will stipulated three things. I want to ask you, pop quiz, in how many of the three items in their father's will, to how many of the three items in their father's will did they submit? And it's a trick question. In some ways, the answer is zero. You said, well, no, you, they built the fence where Father's will said to build it. I ask, to how many items in their Father's will did they submit? Submission is yielding your will to someone else's will. Tell me, why did they build the fence where their Father's will said to build it? 
just so happens they think that's the best place to put a fence and they couldn't think of a better place and so their father's will and their will happened to coincide why did they build the barn where they built the barn because their father's will said to build it there but no more than that they thought it ought to go there that's where they would have put the barn even if their father's will didn't say anything about it the first time their father's will and their will clashed what did they do they did their own thing I can stand here tonight and tell you there are folks in the religious world who will do a lot of what the father's will is up to a point at which point they start saying but I don't agree with that, so no, I'm not doing that. But I'll do that, and I'll do that. It's almost as if they think they're going through the cafeteria line and having the authority to choose. Yeah, put that on my plate, but don't you dare put that on there. I don't want any of that. I do want some of that, though, and give me some of this, but no, no, no to that. Now, friends, when you're going through the cafeteria line, you are authorized to make your own choices as to what you will and won't eat if you're of age. I can just see this children saying, Brother Clark said I can make my own choices. You have to be of age, right? I want to ask you, when you go through the Bible, do you have the right, do you have the authority to go through and just say, well, I'll, yeah, give me some of that. I like that doctrine, but nope, I'm not putting that on my theological plate. I do like this part over here, but I'm not really into this, so no, that's not going to be what I believe. Friends, do you and I have the authority to go through the Bible like that, yes or no? No, we don't. I want you to know that there are some people who they come to the will of God and they see it, and when they agree with it, they say, okay, I'll go along with it. I, I didn't write the following statement, but I wish I had. I think it's so spot on, I want to say it twice. And I want it to really sink in and saturate and circulate through your mind. If I believe in the Bible, only the things with which I agree, it's not really the Bible I believe in, it's me. If I believe in the Bible, only the things with which I agree, it's not the Bible I really believe in, it's me. And I don't have the right to believe in me because I'm not inspired, but God's Word is and I need to do what God's Word says. Now, here's what I'm going to do for the rest of the message. I'm going to give you three real-life, more modern-day examples of folks that came in contact with the will of the Father in heaven and had to make a choice. Will I submit to this will of the Father in heaven I've just discovered, or will I do my own willful thing? Let's start in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I used to preach. And I got a phone call one day about a man, and that's where I learned the story I'm about to tell you. This man was 92 years old and had good eyesight, was really into the Bible. In fact, with good specs on and a good eyesight generally for his age and a large print Bible, he read the Bible every day. And one day his Bible reading just so happened to land in John chapter 3 where Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus by night and pays Jesus a very high compliment. Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus doesn't even linger over the compliment. He says, Nicodemus, verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again? How can a man be born again? When he's old, what, what does he enter his mother's womb a second time and then be born? Jesus tries to get Nicodemus out of the physical into the spiritual. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to notice, we've already seen that entering the kingdom phrase a couple of times tonight. We saw it in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And we see Jesus saying, Whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So there is the idea in Matthew 12, 50. You do the will of the Father in heaven and you'll go to heaven. No doubt about it. You're, you're one of his spiritual relatives. So this 92-year-old man, his name was Pop. Everyone called him Pop. His real name was 
Charlie Collins, but everyone called him Pop Collins. So Pop's reading his Bible, and he comes to this verse 5, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so he starts thinking, I better figure out what this means to be born of water and of the Spirit, because if I have not been born of water and of the Spirit, I cannot enter the kingdom. And I want to enter the kingdom, and so let me try to figure this out. Born of water and of the Spirit. Wait a minute. Wasn't I just reading the other day? He started remembering. He couldn't remember the location, but you and I know it is Acts 8. Acts 8, you remember this eunuch was on his way home after having worshipped Jesus, or worshipped in Jerusalem, I should say, and then as he's headed home, a, an inspired preacher, Philip, runs and preaches unto him Jesus. And after the eunuch hears Jesus preached, he says, see, here is what? Water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And so Pop was able to put two and two together. The message of the Holy Spirit flowed through Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch, and after hearing the message of the Holy Spirit through the preacher, he said, I want to be baptized in water. And why would he say that if uh, preaching Jesus doesn't include preaching water baptism? Don't you find it interesting, dear friend, that what you don't read in Acts chapter 8 is this? Hey, you know that sinner's prayer you were talking about just a few minutes ago in your sermon about Jesus? Can you lead me in that now, Philip? Tell me what to say and I'll say it. Is that what you read in your Bible in Acts chapter 8? What you do read is a man who just had Jesus preach to him, saying, see, here is water. Well, what, wonder why he would make the connection. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus arose. We die to the practice of sin. As penitent confessing believers, we're buried with our Lord in baptism. We rise to walk in newness of life. The eunuch understood the necessity of this sacred event. And so he said, here's water. What's stopping me from being baptized right now? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Because remember, it's he that believeth and is baptized who shall be saved. Mark 6. 16, 16, it's not just he that is baptized who shall be saved. It's not just he that believeth who shall be saved. It's he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And so Pop Collins saw this and he said, you know what I need to do? I need to be baptized in water now that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I need to follow that up with being baptized in water. So he dialed up his denominational preacher that he'd known his, for years actually. He said, yeah, uh, can you come to my house, pick me up, take me to the church building and baptize me, please, so I can enter the kingdom of God? His preacher said, Pop, what are, you, what are you talking about? He said, I was reading my Bible today and found a verse I never knew was in there. Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I want to enter the kingdom of God, and so would you please come take me to the church building, baptize me in water so I can be born of water like Jesus said I must do. His preacher said, Pop, you don't even understand what that's about. When it says born of water, he claimed, it's talking about a woman who's very close to her delivery time and her water will break and then she'll go through the process of labor and delivery and that's what that born of water phrase means, allegedly. Well, Pop was 92, but he's sharp. He said, now you're saying water here is referring to a woman who's about to give birth to a baby. That's right. Well, he says, it says, how can a man be born? Isn't this talking about a man that's being born, not an infant? But then he also asked this question. He said, um, when I was reading the other day after this man heard Jesus preached, he said, see, here is water. When he said, see, here is water, was he pointing to a woman that was almost ready to give birth to a baby? Well, no, no. What was he pointing to? Well, he was pointing at actual water. Okay, and did, was he baptized in that water? Yeah, he was. Well, that's what I want to do. Come pick me up. His preacher would not do it. 
He said, Pop, you got down at the mourner's bench years ago at our revival, and you asked the Lord Jesus to come into your heart, and you made him the Lord of your life then, and you're fine, you don't need... He said, I used to think that too. I used to think I was fine, but that's before I read with my own eyes, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I want to enter the kingdom of God. Will you help? No, I will not do it. If I baptize you and you catch pneumonia and die, I will not be held accountable for that is what the preacher told him. So Pop said, okay, I'll find someone else. So he gets out the phone book, yellow pages, starts calling churches at random. Yes, I've been reading my Bible this morning and I've seen where Jesus said, except a man is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I want to enter the kingdom of God. Will you come to my house, pick me up, take me to your church building and baptize me so I can obey what Jesus said? I'm sure you can guess what every person he called and this listing of the churches in the yellow pages, guess what every church he called wanted to do with him over the phone instead? Can you guess? Why don't you just say a prayer with us over the phone and we'll take care of it that way. Pop said, no, I already tried that. I didn't know this verse was in my Bible when I tried that. I want to do what this verse says. He couldn't find anyone, so he got desperate enough to call Baptist Hospital in Knoxville. Now, I want you to put yourself in the sandals, uh, the shoes of the switchboard operator at Baptist Hospital when you answer the phone and say, Baptist Hospital, how may I direct your call? And the voice on the other end of the line says, uh, yeah, could you connect me with the baptismal department, please? I'm sorry, what? Uh, could you connect me with your baptizing department? Uh, sir, you do realize you've called a hospital? Well, yes, but because of the name of your hospital, I thought you might be into providing baptism upon request, and I'm requesting one. Perhaps it was providential that when he placed that call, the lady on duty was a member of the Young High Church of Christ in Knoxville, Tennessee, now known as the South Knoxville Church of Christ. She knew that there was some significance to baptism because she'd studied her Bible and heard the sermons and knew what the truth was on the matter. And here's a man pleading to be baptized, and no one will do it. So she says, let me call our local preacher, and he will come and he will help you. And so... Local preacher went, studied with him, made sure he understood the church he was about to enter, and they took Pop Collins, and when I met him after he was baptized, I'm not exaggerating when I say his arms were about as big around as a thick broomstick handle, but no more. He was a very feeble, frail-looking man. They took him and put him on a stretcher and dipped him after they took his confession, they dipped him gently beneath a watery grave of baptism, brought him right back up, and Pop Collins went on his way rejoicing. Why? For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother, my sister, my mother. Now travel with me to Etowah, Tennessee, my first preaching job. I went to Etowah, Tennessee, and was the associate minister there, and we had a gospel meeting coming up, and so we were door knocking. I took a flyer, knocked on the man's porch column because he was sitting on his porch, and I just rapped on the column, and he invited me on up, and what you got there? And I showed it to him, and he surveyed it, and he said, hmm, Church of Christ, uh, can I ask you, he said, aren't you that group? that teaches baptism's got something to do with saving us. And I said, well, we would want to teach only what the Bible says, and the Bible says, and I, I started to go, and he said, young man, let me stop you right there. How old are you? And I told him, at the time I was in my early 20s. It's almost 40 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long. But he said, uh, <laughs> I've been reading my Bible for more years than you've been on the earth. And I'm going to tell you right now, there, and I'm quoting him, so forgive the improper English grammar. 
There ain't no place in the Bible that comes right out and says baptism saves us. I'll tell you that much. And that's exactly the way he worded it. Well, I noticed within arm's reach of him was a Bible. I said, sir, I notice you have a Bible nearby. Do you believe the Bible? Sir, I believe every word of the Bible, young man. I said, that's fantastic. We need more people in this world who will embrace and believe every word of the Bible. May I ask you to... Uh, May I ask you to look at one verse in your Bible with me? And I don't think he really wanted to. He was kind of reluctant to read, but I think he felt it a little obligated. He just professed his love for the Bible, his willingness to do everything it said. So he reached over and grabbed his Bible, and I said, w Would you locate 1 Peter chapter 3? And he did. And I said, Now you'll notice there in verse 20, it mentions that the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. And within that ark few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. And then it says, the like figure whereunto, well, what, would you read it? Would you read it out loud? Well, at first he didn't read it out loud. He read it silently, but he mouthed the words so clearly to what he was reading that I couldn't know exactly what phrase he kept reading. And I'm pretty sure you can guess which one he kept reading over and remember he just said there ain't no place in the Bible that comes right out and says baptism saves us I'll tell you that much and now here he is reading a verse which says the like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and I watched his lips. Baptism does also now save us. Baptism does also now save us. He kept reading it over and over again. I waited and very kindly tried to remain very cordial, of course, as we ought to. I said, sir, what does the inspired apostle Peter say that baptism does in this text by the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And he looked back down at his Bible, which was trembling in his hands, and then he looked up at me, and then he looked back down at his Bible, and then he said, well, he says it saves us, but I don't believe it, and then he told me to get off of his property. And I appreciate the fact that you didn't chuckle at that, like sometimes people do, because I wasn't there to win an argument. I was there to win a soul. Sometimes to win a soul, we have to make reasonable arguments and make people think through things. But I, I was not there to, whoo -hoo, I told him, I got him with the word of God, didn't I? Boy, I, he had nothing to say when I finished with him. Friends, I'm not being superficial when I tell you I left that man's porch with a lump in my throat, tears in my eyes, and this terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach that a man had just said, I believe every word of the Bible, young man, and then just seconds later read something from the Bible and said, I don't believe it, now get off of my property. Remind you at all of those two boys and their father's will? Yeah, I'll submit to that. I agree with that. I'll submit to that. I agree with, no, nope, I don't agree with that. Not doing that. That's this man on the porch in Etowah. Now wait, let's just take the Lord's own description. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother, my sister, my mother. He, the first person, Pop Collins, was he willing to do the will of the Father in heaven he discovered, yes or no? The man in Knoxville, yes. This man in Etowah, was he willing to do the will of the Father in heaven when he discovered it in 1 Peter 3.21? He said he was not. If you ask him, are you in the family of God, what do you think he would have said? Yes. Does Jesus want him to be in his family? Yes. But friends, do you need to obey the gospel to be in the family of God or not? Do you need to do the will of the Father in heaven, yes or no? Yes. Now, there was a television preacher on Larry King Live when Larry King was on CNN doing his nightly program and he invited this uh, preacher from a, a mega church you might say to come and and uh, 
and be a part of his program. And he asked him this question. He said, what if someone doesn't believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? What if a Jew does not accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God? What if a Muslim is unwilling to embrace that Jesus is the Son of God? And this preacher who is televised still regularly sat there on that program and said, Larry, I'm not in the judging business. Now, friends, it's true that God is the judge and Jesus is going to be the judge. All judgments been committed to him by the Father, John 5.22. It's the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Yeah, I believe all that. But did the judge give us any indication as to how he's going to rule? He said in John 14, and let me ask it this way. If Jesus had been on the program that night, if he'd been on the program, what do you think he would have said if Larry King said, are you saying that you're the only way to the Father? Are you saying that? That no one can go to heaven except through you? Friend, I want to ask you, what do you think Jesus would have said in response to that? He would have said what he already said in John 14, 6. What did he say? I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You and I must not be ashamed of that. We must preach it lovingly, but firmly. And so... Here's two people that I've shown you. Now let's go to the third and final place, Indianapolis, Indiana. My dad is conducting this study. It just so happens that he shows this woman, 1 Peter 3.21. And when she reads 1 Peter 3.21, she takes her fist and she slams it into the kitchen table. And she was very, very angry and my dad knew that it was wise to let her kind of cool down and so he waited for her to kind of cool down he says why are you angry she said you mean to tell me this verse has been in my bible all these years i've owned the bible all these years i could have read this verse earlier and all these years, the Bible comes right out and says baptism does also now save us, but I've always been taught that it didn't. And I've never believed that it did. And if I'd only read my Bible, I could have known better. Number one, I'm mad at myself because I didn't read God's Word and check it out for myself. Number two, I will confess, I'm... I'm bothered by the fact that all these preachers and teachers over the years have told me that it wasn't necessary for my salvation. And here it is black, plain black and white. It says baptism does also now save us. I am angry that I've been misled. She said, but I'm going to fix that tonight. Will you take me to the church building and baptize me right now? And my dad talked to her a little bit more about the previous steps required before baptism. And they took her, and that night they called some of the members, hey, we're having a baptism if you want to come up. We're having a baptism. And sure enough, that night they, they baptized her into Jesus Christ for the remission of her sins, to be saved by the blood of Christ, to be added to the church of Christ, the one you read about in the Bible. And then she came forth out of that watery grave, beaming and smiling from ear to ear, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother, my sister, my mother. Is she in the family of God? She was. Now, I want to close with Luke's statement that he makes in Luke 8, and I want to give you an illustration that's just so simple, and you may have heard similar illustrations to it good, then use this one, add it to your list of illustrations, and use all of them that are effective and helpful. But in Luke 8, Luke gives us a summary account of what Jesus said in Matthew's account, and he includes this one summary statement that I really want to zoom in on as we close. As the multitude gathered, Luke 8, 19, and came to him and told him, your mother and brothers are outside wanting to see you. Luke just cuts right to the summary and the conclusion. Jesus said, my mother and my brethren are these which, number one, what? Hear the word of God. And number two, what? 
they do it. They don't just hear it. They're not hearers only. They're doers of the word, James 1.22. These people hear it and do it. And so how much do we need to hear? How much do we need to do? I need to hear I'm a sinner, that I'm headed for a devil's hell. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. I need to hear that except I believe that Jesus is the Christ, I'm going to die in my sins, John 8.24. I need to hear that God has commanded all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17.30. And that the goodness of God should lead me to repentance, Romans 2.4. And I need to hear that confession is made with the mouth unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 and Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Friends, I need to hear those things, but then I need to do them. But there's something else. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. I need to do that, not just hear it. Now let's say that you're at the mall with your son. We'll say he's nine years old for illustration purposes. We'll call him Joey. Uh, he is uh, with you at the, the mall. You're enthralled by the sales going on. And Joey's enthralled by the fact that he looks out and there in the concourse, right outside the store entrance, Grandma shows up. He runs to Grandma. You know how boys love their grandmas? And Grandma assumes you gave him blessing to come out with him, with her. And uh, so she takes, would you like to have a toy? Yes. And so Grandma and Joey take off to buy him a toy. But you don't know this. When you turn around, all you know is your son Joey is gone. And panic registers on your face. And people in your store there with you say, can we help you? You seem so upset. Yes, my son, did you, he was just here. I know I, we, we didn't see what, we saw him, but we don't know where he is. We'll help you look for him. But then others say, well, I didn't see him. Can you give me a description of your boy so that I can help find him? Yes. His name is Joey. I told you that. He's nine years old. He's got blonde hair, uh, blue eyes. He's wearing a yellow shirt. He's got on a brown pair of trousers. Oh, yeah. He's got a very prominent birthmark on the left side of his neck. All right. So here goes the search party, and it's not long until one of them's coming toward you with a child that they're dragging behind them. The child is kicking and screaming. He's wearing a red sweatshirt and a pair of blue jeans. And you say, what, 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 what are you doing? I told you my son is wearing a yellow shirt and brown trousers. You also said your son's name is Joey, didn't you? Yes. What's your name, boy? Joey. I got him. No, you got yourself in a whole lot of trouble is what you did. That's not, well, you said your son, well, that people can have the same name and not be related. Okay, well, if you're going to be all nitpicky, find someone else to help you. Okay. Here comes someone, maybe it looks promising because you do see a yellow shirt and blonde hair. You get a little closer, the eyes are blue, but the guy's name is Ralph, he's 14. Wait a minute, here comes a boy, yellow shirt, brown trousers, blonde hair, blue eyes, nine years old. His name is Joey, jackpot. Uh, there is no birthmark on the left side of his neck. Are you going to insist on one missing criteria in order to identify that as your son? Are you going to insist on the birthmark or not, mom, yes or no? You know you are. You're not going to say, well, I was hoping for a complete match. That's close enough. Come home with me, boy. You're going to be in trouble if you try that. Friends, the birthmark matters to you in identifying your child. Does the new birthmark matter to God? Think about it. A child of God hears, believes, repents, confesses. Which of those criteria do you need to have to be the, identified as one of his? Do the will of the Father in heaven, and that includes not just hearing believing, repenting, confessing, but it includes the new birthmark, the mark that says, I've been born of water like the man was in Knoxville, Tennessee. I want to close by saying this. Years ago, I preached a sermon similar to this, and a lady to my right, in the very back of the auditorium, soon as the invitation song started, she came down the aisle faster than anyone in my ministry has ever come down the aisle. She was not 
waiting and she, in fact she didn't even sit down she started heading for the entrance to the baptistry the local preacher caught her just before she got in the door to go back to the baptistry and she basically didn't even stop she said as she was still walking i'm not waiting another second to become a member of the family of god They'd started bringing her there when the school, when the church bus picked her up as a little girl and all those years had gone by. She'd never become one of his. And that night when they baptized her, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. We'd like to see someone tonight put on their Lord in baptism. I know what time it is, friends. It's time to consider it matters of eternity where time will be no more. And this is, I would, would, is anyone here unwilling to sit for a few minutes and watch someone baptized into Christ? Anyone here unwilling to do that? I hope you'll come if you need to. We'll be glad to sit here and watch that blessed event take place. And we'll rejoice with you that who someone has done the will of the Father in heaven and is now another member of the family. Won't you do what you need to do without delay? Right now, please. As together we stand and sing, won't you please come? some scripture again like we read this morning from Matthew 26 and Matthew 27 to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper those who have not partaken and those online that have not partaken of the Lord's Supper may this help you from scripture in Matthew 26 the high priest had heard Jesus say that the Son of Man is sitting at the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven and the high priest tore his clothes and he said, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witness? Look now, he, we hear blasphemy. What do you think 
They answered, he is deserving of death. They spit in his face, they beat him, and others stuck him, struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Over in chapter 27, now they released Barabbas to them. They had scourged Jesus and delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. They stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him, and they took a reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put their clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. In verse 35, as they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him. We see in these passages here, they spit on him, they, they mocked him, they beat him, and they crucified him, and then they sat there and stood there and watched him die. To think that Jesus did that for you as a, so that you could be his child, to know that he was willing to pay such a price and to suffer a great, great amount just so you could be called a child of God one day. At this time, if you'll have your bread ready, we'll offer a prayer and may your mind go back to that great sacrifice. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we want to never forget what great sacrifice you let your son pay for our salvation. We thank you that not only he loved us, but you loved us, and the Spirit recorded that love for us. May the one that partakes at this time, may their mind go back and see the great price that was paid for them in the offering of the body and the very life of Jesus. It's through his blood. Blessed name we pray, and amen. Concerning the blood in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus, in, in verse 27, it says, He took the cup, He gave thanks, and then He gave it to them, saying, Drink all of it, all of you, for this is My blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. His blood had to be offered and at least seven different ways that I can figure out that his blood was shed or came forth from his body. And so that blood had to be shed so that our sins could be washed away. And so at this time, would you partake of the cup? May your mind go back to that blood that makes possible the remission of your sins. Let us pray. Father, we come before you once again. There's no way we could ever thank you enough. But we say thank you, Father, over and over again. Especially at this moment when your people are gathered together and we want to be mindful, mindful of that shedding of his blood that makes possible that our sins could be washed away. Father, thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the offering of his life. 
And may you bless the partaker at this time. May they find joy in seeing the love behind that sacrifice that was paid for them. Through Jesus we pray, and amen. like to read for the offering another part of our worship in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks it will be opened. Now what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread, will he not give him, would he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? God is a generous God. And God has given us many, many wonderful things, both physically and spiritually. And so tonight, you have that opportunity, if you have not done so, to offer. We have collection plates in the back for those who are here. Those who are watching may send that in to the church here at Rolling Hills. But let us give thanks to our gracious God at this time. Father, you have taught us to be generous. You have given and given and given and given and father we are trying our very best to learn from that generosity to be your generous children we pray father that our offering this day has been generous we pray that it has pleased you that we have not shamed you in any way but that you see that generosity that you've taught us in our offering. May you bless this eldership. May they continue to use this money given to you for the upbuilding of your kingdom, the feeding of the poor, the clothing of those without clothes. May it help preachers to be trained that your name may be known. But may you bless these men who will divide it in ways that it needs to be divided, that it may bless many, and they too may know you as a generous God. Thank you. We pray this prayer for our, through our blessed Savior Jesus, and amen. We have had a blessed day. I always love first, the first day of the week because, as I've told you many times, we get to come in and out of the world for a while. And uh, it's the Lord's Day, and boy, what a good one this has been. Thank you, Brother Clark, for all the good lessons. And uh, certainly been blessed uh, this evening with this uh, lesson. I did leave something out when I was making the announcements. Uh, we met this afternoon, the elders met with Hunter and Evelyn Igo, and uh, they both have been baptized properly and have been members of another congregation, but they've been visiting with us for a few weeks, and they want to place their membership here, and they want to be part of the church here now and uh, work under this eldership. And Evelyn's not here, but Hunter, stand up and show them who you are. We are equal opportunity embarrassers around here. We make... All right, sit down, Hunter. All right. It's a good man and, and his mother, and uh, we uh, are happy to have them with us. Is there anything else before we dismiss? Don't let me leave anything out. Stand up if you feel like it, and we'll be dismissed with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you so much for setting this day aside for us to uh, spend time in worship to you and with one another. Help us as we go into another week and help us to remember the lessons from this day 
Thank you for Brother B.J. and the good job that he has done in sharing your word with us. We pray your blessings upon the rest of our meeting, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings, and upon the church here as we continue in the future to strive to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.